Thank you so much. That's the high point of the entire show, so it's all downhill from here. Um, before we break down into smaller discussion groups, as I like to say, I'd like to introduce on the fiddle, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee, Brittany Haas. <laughs> And from an almost as ex exotic place as that, from the great state of Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> Mr. Jacob Jolliffe. <laughs> Thank you for coming out. Is everybody here? Yes, you're all here. This is great. Um, this is an Earl Scruggs tribute show, and amongst the tunes we'll be doing will be tunes from these rare recordings that I got a hold of with John Hartford jamming with Earl Scruggs in the late, uh, late 90s at John Hartford's house. That last tune, Bill Cheatham being one of them. And as close as I can get it, I'll be playing fairly note for note the way Earl played these tunes. And we have a curfew. We have to be out of here at a certain time. And I'll spend about half the next hour or so tuning which is what banjo players do. And when you're a banjo player, you're sort of up here, but the sound, you poor people in the front row, it's really obnoxious. But anyway, I'm gonna start with a tune that Earl Scruggs played in the three finger style. And I also recently got a hold of some writings that Earl did in a Mickey Mouse notebook, believe it or not, telling stories about his childhood. And he mentioned how he was really much of a home-loving boy. He never really wanted to leave Flint Hill, North Carolina. He thought maybe he would get as far as Asheville and move up into the mountains. He wanted to have a mountain stream going through his house if he bought a house there, which I thought was a great image. And when he was a kid, first learning to play the banjo, he worked on a farm, worked on the family farm in Flint Hill. And he'd get up at 6.30 in the morning and by 7.30 or 8 o'clock, he's out in the fields and stayed there till. Um, dusk basically, but he'd be behind his mule with a plow and he'd be like doing finger patterns on the plow handle with this hand and chords with this hand. So he was fairly addicted to the banjo. But the first tune he played in the three finger style was a tune called Reuben, which is a train song. He told me one time he was playing in this two finger style and then suddenly that third finger, he said it was sort of like the movies, that third finger just got in there. So I'm gonna recreate that sound starting with two fingers and then three fingers. So this is Reuben. Okay, another 10 minutes while I retune. Um, another thing that was on those recordings that um, when we did this show from last fall, I uh, had a lot of tunes I hadn't found yet, but this is a tune that Earl played solo on these recordings. And he said it was a fiddle tune he would play at square dances when he was a kid, when no one else would show up in the band, the fiddle player wouldn't show up, he would just play this next tune solo. 
and it's a fiddle tune he adapted to the banjo, and it's called Shout Little Lulu. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'd like to uh, bring out uh, another gentleman who you've not seen yet tonight. Also from, originally from Atlanta, Georgia, currently from Brooklyn, New York, and then Western Massachusetts, Mr. Michael Daves. Please make him welcome. Yeah, all right. All right. So, um, what Earl would do, what Earl would do would be to um, basically, he, he didn't have a metronome when he was growing up, so what he and his brother Horace would do, Horace played guitar and Earl played banjo, of course, and they would stand in front of their house in Flint Hill and uh, they'd start playing this tune, Sally Gooden, and they would walk around opposite sides of the house and if they were in time, when they got to the back of the house, they knew they had their time together. If not, they would go back to the front <laughs> and maybe repeat this exercise several times. And we did this last time, and it sort of worked out. I lost Michael, though, somewhere over there. He was in the theater about two stories up, I think. <laughs> but uh, we're going to see if we can try this again, try to recreate this concept of going in different areas and then coming back in time. I don't think it's worked yet, but we'll try it anyway. So here's Sally Gooden. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I think we went in opposite directions last time. Do you remember that? We tried to make it a little <laughs> different for you for tonight. Uh, let's bring out uh, the rest of our merry band here, which are back there. Oh, look who we have.
you've met Jake, you've met Michael, you've met Brittany, but you have not met our bass player, also from Brooklyn. New York. If we have any folks from Brooklyn here, you'd be really proud that we got so many Brooklynites on stage. Yeah, let's hear it for Brooklyn. That was fairly faint, but Staten Island? Oh, looks okay, sorry, 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 sorry. We, we played in um, Connecticut last night in Old Saybrook, and this almost the same band. And uh, who got the most applause of anybody? And we don't want this to happen again tonight, but we have this exceptional bass player back here. We have to handicap him. He's going to play with one hand behind his back. Mr. Oh, yeah. Jared Engel on the bass. So in these writings that um, Earl Scruggs was describing, um, he was playing with a guy named Lost John Miller in October of 45 and had a chance to audition for Bill Monroe because Bill Monroe's fiddler Jim, Jim Shoemate set this up. So um, Earl and uh, Lost John Miller are heading back to Knoxville, Tennessee, where they were based, but uh, Lost John said he would drive Earl to Nashville and drop him off. Well, they'd stay to audition for Bill Monroe, so Earl could audition for Bill. They get to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, the Tulane Hotel at the appointed time, and uh, Monroe's not there. And they wait half an hour, hour, hour and a half, and still no Monroe. And Lost John says, well, I got to go back to, back to Knoxville. You're going to have to get yourself back, take a bus back. Meanwhile, Earl had this, like, terrible fever. He had the flu. He felt really sick, but he's just hanging out. Three hours late, Bill Monroe shows up. And what Earl wrote in these writings, he said he was so impressed by the beautiful head of hair that Bill Monroe had. <laughs> and these wonderful sideburns he had. He was more impressed with the look. <laughs> this is serious. I, I read it myself in these writings that Earl did. And um, so Earl plays Sally Gooden, what we just played, and uh, a tune called Dear Old Dixie for the audition. And he said Monroe was just dancing because he was so happy to, I mean, it's Earl Scruggs, even though he wasn't Earl Scruggs back then. <laughs> and then Earl thought, okay, I'll, I'll just get on the bus and go back to, back to Knoxville. And Monroe said, hey, let's, let's jam with the, foggy, uh, with the uh, bluegrass boys so I can hear how you sound with the band. So they spend another two or three hours jamming, and Earl's just dying. And finally, he goes down to the bus station with this terrible case of the flu, 11 o'clock at night, gets on the bus. There are no seats. <laughs> and he doesn't, get to no till Knox he doesn't get to Knoxville till 7 in the morning, standing there with the flu. But anyway, he finally got a chance <laughs> to join the bluegrass boys. And uh, the very first tune he ever recorded with Bill Monroe, in fact, recorded anywhere else, was a tune called Heavy Traffic Ahead. We will recreate this for you right now. Traffic ahead. Open guns, rainbow, rainbow. Heavy traffic 
thank you, we're going to feature Mr. Jacob Jolliffe on the mandolin on a tune that Bill Monroe claims to have written, and we'll just leave it right there. <laughs> we don't want to get real political, folks. Um, okay, Earl Scruggs actually wrote it, but Bill Monroe took credit for it, so. But Earl got sweet revenge, and we'll get back to that later. Anyway, this is a tune called Bluegrass Breakdown, recorded right around 1947. Lester Flatt was in the band at the same time. It was sort of the paradigm for all bluegrass bands to come after this. Bluegrass Breakdown. Thank you. We're going to continue on now with the Flanton Scruggs tune. What happened? Uh, Flanton Scruggs left Bill Monroe in 1948 and decided to start their own band, the Foggy Mountain Boys. And um, Bill Monroe wasn't too pleased about this because, you know, if you had Flanton Scruggs in your band, you'd want to keep them. So there was a little animosity there. And so in the early days of, um, well, let's say from 1950 to 53, in that time period, if you wanted to become a permanent member of the Grand Ole Opry, you had to have all the members of the Grand Ole Opry vote you in. You, couldn't, you could have no dissents. So for three years, Flat and Scruggs kept getting turned down because you know, there were these dissents. And they finally found out that the one person who said no was Bill Monroe. <laughs> so the guy who was the president of Martha White Flower uh, that sponsored Flat and Scruggs on the Grand Ole Opry said, well, listen, uh, he said this to the head of the Grand Ole Opry. He said, look, we give you a million dollars worth of advertising every year. If you don't get Flatten Scruggs as m per permanent members of the Opry, we're going to rescind all that money. 
and Flatten Scruggs got on the Opry. So <laughs> that's how that went. And one of their iconic tunes that they recorded that you all know, Salty Dog. Thank you. Most of you know this next tune. This is an iconic tune credited to Earl Scruggs. But in fact, um, our bass player, Jared Engel, um, found this rare recording of Flatt and Scruggs's. This is true. Their bass player, Jake Tullock, cousin Jake Tullock, playing a bass version of Foggy Mountain Breakdown. In fact, Jake Tullock wrote Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Would you kind of like to, I mean, Jared transcribed the entire bass <laughs> aspect. It's a very rare recording, you have to understand this. And Jared's gonna recreate the origins, the origin story of Foggy Mountain Breakdown. And you know what used to happen in the old days, like Bill Monroe would be on the same bill with the Stanley Brothers, and the Stanley Brothers would listen through the dressing room walls to hear what Bill Monroe was playing, and then they'd open up for Bill Monroe and play the same songs he was about to play in his set. And the same thing happened in this band because Michael Daves, while um, he heard the same recording and he worked up the same thing that Jared was playing. And so you're gonna, so he sort of stole the whole thing from Jared. I mean, you'll, you'll get to see what I'm saying in just a second. Please, Jared Engel, if you will. The genius, Jared Engel.
you so much. You know, you know, there's all this lore that goes, I mean, when you were talking about that origin story of Jake coming up with that bass part, like, there are you know, rumors that Ornette Coleman was there uh, no, when he, sure, you know, sure. he, I think. Because um, on Ornette Coleman's first album, Free Jazz, I believe it was called, his bass player, Charlie Hayden, and this is, ac this is actually true, as was the origin story of Foggy Mountain Breakdown, of course. Um, his bass player, Charlie Hayden, played Old Joe Clark for a solo. That's actually true. Check it out. In fact, I think Kenny Baker, who was Bill Monroe's main fiddler for many years, said he was quoted as saying, bluegrass is a line on a line between bluegrass and jazz. <laughs> that was many years ago. I'm still trying to figure out. I mean, it's very zen. We're going to feature Mr. Jacob Jolliffe on a vocal right now, the tune that Flatten Scruggs recorded back 54 or thereabouts. Blue Ridge Cabin Home. Jake's going to sing a song now called Blue Ridge Cabin Home. Thank you.
I was talking to Earl Scruggs one time, and he mentioned that what he thought he gave to the banjo was syncopation, which is where notes don't land on the downbeat or the upbeat, the upbeat but in between places where you don't expect it. And I thought, well, Earl, you, you did a whole lot more than just add syncopation, which he did. One thing he did was create these tuners, and I shouldn't, no, ne never mind, I'm, I don't want to tell you about that. Never, let's talk about something else. Okay, anyway, there are these tunes that uh, Earl Scruggs would play that I'll play sometimes where it looks like I can tune perfectly between notes, like I have this amazing ear, but in fact, there are these little gizmos here that allow you to do it perfectly every time, these special tuners. But before Earl created the tuners, they would do this very special thing. He would do it by ear. He would just tune by ear. And I was having dinner with Earl and his son Gary one time. And Gary said, Dad, tell Tony how you invented those tuners, the idea of tuning the, the string in the middle of an instrumental. He said that he dreamt it. Earl Scruggs dreamt detuning these strings. So the first tune he ever recorded using this tuning method was a tune called Earl's Breakdown. And when you're a banjo player, you're supposed to name a tune after yourself. <laughs> which I've had to do after playing since 1963 when I was two years, three years, four years old. <laughs> anyway, um, and so, and so, um, anyway, so they go into the studio to, studio to record this Earl's Breakdown, and he's just detuning, and he does it perfectly. The first time he did it, recorded this, it was just by ear, detuning this perfectly. He got it back and forth perfectly. And, but the fiddle player, the fiddle player was not too happy with the fiddle player's solo, so they had to do it a second time. No, it wasn't you. But anyway, this was 1954 or thereabouts. So they did a second take, and the fiddle player nailed his solo. Earl was not too happy. He didn't get it all the way back up. He got it about back up to here, somewhere in the mid thing. And he went, and he would have had to have done that. So he, instead of going on the second string, he went on the third string retuned and came back to finish the tune. The next day, Earl calls up the engineer and says, look, you know that, I don't care about the fiddle player. I'm, it's my gig. Uh, forget the guy, that second solo that the fiddle player was happy with, you know, forget that take. Let's take the first take where I got it perfectly. And the engineer said, oh, we, re we recorded over that take. So the one that got away. So we're gonna hopefully not recreate the sound of that second take and do a little bit of Earl's breakdown for you.
thank you so much. I already talked to you about the generosity of Martha White Flower. And at Carnegie Hall, Flynn Scruggs played at Carnegie Hall, and it was recorded thanks to Earl's wife, Louise. Louise was Earl Scruggs, well, Flynn Scruggs' manager for many years, starting in the mid-50s, and she was real, really a trailblazer uh, for women in business in the South. And again, in Nashville, what would happen is someone would call up Louise and Earl's home, and Louise would pick up and someone would say, uh, can I speak to Earl, please? And Louise would say, oh, what's this about? Well, I'd like to book Flatt and Scruggs. And she said, well, you can talk to me about that. And he, the gentleman would say, well, I'd rather talk to Earl about that. Louise would say, well, you talk to, but you'll talk to me about that or you won't get Flatt and Scruggs. And so um, she did a lot for kind of, you know, making their career be what it was. And in terms of Carnegie Hall, they played here in 62. And uh, rather than it just being a nice footnote in the career of Flatt and Scruggs, she called Columbia Records and said, why don't you uh, record this concert? And uh, Columbia Records said, according to her, well, how do we do that? <laughs> well, you put a tape recorder at the side of the stage and you run some lines and some microphones, and they did. And it's one of Flatt and Scruggs' favorite albums, and uh, folks like it, it's a great album. And what would happen, the audience, several people in the audience, maybe five, five or six, would yell out for the Martha White theme. They, just, they were screaming, Martha White! And, um, and Lester would say, well, we didn't know you folks knew about that in this part of the country. We'll try it, though. It was the theme song for Flatt and Scruggs, the Martha White theme. So if some of you want to start yelling out Martha White. Martha White. Oh, all right, okay, all right, all right. We'll do it, we'll do it. Thank you very much. That's the audience participation for tonight. Okay, so here's the Martha White theme. favorite parts of a Flatt and Scruggs show would be fiddle and banjo, and Lester Flatt would introduce it and said, we're going to get Earl and Paul Warren, their fiddle player for the Foggy Mountain Boys, and, and uh, do a little fiddle banjo number. He said, just a fiddle and a banjo used to be in a band. So we're going to kind of recreate that sound right now with Brittany Haas, who, by the way, has a brand new album with her sister that came out yesterday. <laughs> And they, they were racking their brains for months to come up with a title for the album. It's called <laughs> Haas. H-A-A-S. <laughs> Ask for it by name. Um, we recorded this on an album of mine called Territory with this young lady playing a great version of Salt River. I didn't know I could stand over here. This is great. <laughs> okay. How should we start it? You just you, okay. you just do it. <laughs>
You should all get to play with Brittany Haas. One of my, she's amazing. Let's have another hand for Brittany. Haas. Well, this is a tune that uh, you all know. We did this the last time also, but we can't not do it for this show. And it's the tune that um, forced Bela Fleck to play the banjo. He heard this tune and just picked up a banjo, and the rest is history. So, yes, it's the ballad of Jed Clampett. <laughs> right? And I'm going to sing it. You can all leave now. Thank you. <laughs> Except you're going to sing along also, so. And since we were here the last time, and we're not going to do it for you tonight, but there was a fourth verse. You never knew that, did you? It's a uh, secret ancient uh, something or other. I, I think they found it in an Egyptian crypt, apparently, the fourth verse of this. And, um, but what I usually find is the first two verses everyone sing along on, and then the third verse, people kind of trail off. They don't know that last verse. But if you know it, sing it loud to make up for the people that don't. It's the Ballad of Judd Clampett. story about a man named Jack. Her mountaineer barely fed, his family fed. Then one day he was shooting at some food, and up from the ground come a bubbling crew. That is black wolf. This tea. Excellent. Now the next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kin folks said, they said California is the place you ought to be. It's rolling up the front and the head in Beverly. That is swimming pools, movie stars. Now it's time to say goodbye to Jed and all his kin. They would like to thank you folks for kindly dropping in. You're all welcome back next week to this locality. They have a heap and helping of their hospitality. Beverly Hillbillies, that's what they call them now. Nice folks, y'all come back here. You guys did beautifully, thank you. You know our bass player, you love our bass player. We're gonna feature on, on this next tune. And Earl and uh, the Foggy Mountain bass player, Jake Tullock, who wrote, as I mentioned earlier, Foggy Mountain Breakdown, um, would do duets, just the two of them. And. Uh, you can see these things, they have these old Martha White shows on television. Uh, if you go to YouTube, you can find them. And they do this next tune, You Can't Stop Me From Dreaming. And at one part of the tune, Jake starts to drop the bass. Are we gonna try that? He does. Okay. We didn't practice this. Let's just see, this. let's see how this turns <laughs> out. Um, and then there's a very surprising ending that Earl does on this recording, or on this film. So um, I will explain why later. So here's, you can't stop me from dreaming.
Mr. Jared Engel, folks. How about that ending? What? <laughs> he really did that. What do you, why do you think he did that? Any guesses? Early jazz records. Well, besides that. <laughs> Thank you. Who said that? Oh, you knew this already. <laughs> so what, is it, what does the bass do all night long? Thank you. He was imitating the bass. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so um, we're going to do a tune right now. This was right towards the end of Flatt and Scruggs' time together. They broke up in 1969, and just before that, they recorded this tune. <laughs> and if you hear Lester Flatt singing this, he seems really uncomfortable and sort of out of his elements, out of his element on this. It's a Bob Dylan tune, <laughs> and uh, we ask you to sing along. We're going to foreshorten it a little bit because it has 20 verses. But um, <laughs> it's all right, Ma. No, it's not that. It's a different one. <laughs> and um, as, as uncomfortable as, as Lester Flatt sounded singing this, um, Michael is uncomfortable imitating Lester Flatt singing this and out of his element. So please send lots of love <laughs> through thought vibrations to his pineal gland, if you'd be so kind. And... Um, this is Rainy Day Women, 12 and 35. Please sing along on the important <laughs> chorus. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to, uh, before we run out of time here, we're going to do a few tunes that are on these, uh, these rare recordings of John Hartford and Earl Scruggs jamming, one of which is Liza Jane. And it's, uh, it's just such a great tune. And uh, I've started recording some of these tunes for an album that will come out sometime in the not distant, way distant future anyway. Uh, so this is Liza Jane. And uh, Brittany was on this original recording that we did, and uh, Mike Bubb was playing bass, and this is how they, on the original recording was bass, banjo, and fiddle, so we're gonna recreate the sound of Liza Jane, and we might have someone singing in the middle of all this, I'm not sure who it'll be yet, but.
We're going to do another tune from these jam sessions. And um, somewhere in the 80s, um, I was playing at the Birchmere with this band I was in called Skyline. And uh, John Hartford was there. And he mentioned that he was in the jam session with Earl. And they did a tune called Casey Jones. And uh, John played it in kind of in C tuning. And uh, you know, as best as he could remember what Earl did. And it was really exciting. Earl recording Casey, or playing Casey Jones, which was a tune I grew up hearing. But then he did it, Earl did it with John Hartford in these jam sessions in the 90s in a totally different key, in a totally different way. And we're going to recreate this. It's another tune that will be on this album. Casey Jones. Thank you very much. That ending is what Earl did on that jam session. What's that? <laughs> he never did anything like it. That's the great thing about these, these jams. Um, we're going to do another thing quickly for you because we're running out of time. That it's a jam session, uh, same jam session with Earl and John Hartford. And John Hartford dances on this. You know how he would dance on that plywood board on this recording. And there's no audience. He's just wanted to dance on this tune. And see if you can figure out what this tune is. I'm looking through these jam sessions and like, what? They, they did that? <laughs> anyway, here we go.
Yes, thank you. All right, this may be our last number. We'll play it fast. Anyway, uh, another tune that they did uh, that I had a chance to record is John Hartford's Gentle On My Mind, slightly different version, thanks to Bela Fleck.
my face Two cup hands round a tin can I pretend you told me through my breath and fine That you're waving from the back road By the rivers of my memory Ever smiling, ever gentle on my mind Thank you so much, folks. We have time for two more minutes. And uh, we want to thank John on the sound, Gene and on the lights. Thank you, Gene Ann. And our other Jake for being our artist liaison. Everyone here with Joe's Pup. Thank you all for coming out. We love you guys. Thanks so much. Tony Trishka, everybody. Thank you. Here's Fox Chase. Michael Dave, Jake. Jacob Jolliffe, Jared Engel. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. This is great because we're in overtime now. We're getting more money for doing this encore. No, thanks so much, folks. So this is actually an appropriate tune to finish with. And it's a tune that Flatten Scrug Scruggs recorded right around 1950-51 on Mercury Records. Farewell Blues.
Thanks again, everybody. Take care. Street, all the guys come out to eat. Oh, my pretty little widow, black. My